does your village have a tendency to explode? Are your pixel lights being eaten by zombies at night for no apparent reason? Do you occasionally have fiery meteorites wiping out your base and you don't know what to do? Well, this tutorial may not actually help you then, this is here to get you started in your first village, not to help you mass murder them you horrible monster. But anyway, let's get into the Rise to Ruins tutorial. The first thing you'll want to do upon starting a game of course, is picking the game type. So, Sandbox is self explanatory, you choose how to play it, and there are no rules you can do whatever you like, change time, spawn monsters. Custom is where you set prerequisites beforehand. Peaceful completely and utterly removes all the monsters. Traditional has a very, very low spawn rate of monsters, so it's very good for beginning. And of course, survival is where it's meant to be played. It's difficult, there'll be a lot of monster spawns. The corruption will slowly take over the world, and of course, you'll be fighting for survival. And then there's obviously Nightmare, which ramps up difficulty to the max. Play that if you're a massive masochist, or just like a massive challenge. But obviously, we're going to choose Survival to show you how things work. The world map itself may look a bit complicated, but it's not. It's very, very basic. Each and every one of these squares represents an actual region you can play on. To actually look at any region, just simply click. It will zoom in on the map and show you what it actually looks like to play on. As you can see, there are multiple different places from deserts and beaches to forests to the rocks, and of course, uh, I guess you could call them sandy areas. Each and every one has its own different resources, its own different map layout. In the top, you can change the game mode in case you want to go easier or harder. You can doom your world if you've accidentally wiped out all of your pixel -like villages yet again. But I'll be reminded that you can make several more profiles first before you start wiping out the whole world of some kind of Armageddon. You can also go back to the main menu. You can also see all of your new goals. As you can see, I've just started this one on to show this tutorial, and I just have to survive several days everywhere. Surviving the goals will help with the global corruption power. If you look at the bottom, you have your doomsday clock. How much corruption power out there is? There is. Positive means a higher threat and more enemies. Negative means lower. Here's a regular clock, I play for one day. This is just a numerical showing of the actual global corruption power, which is this, as you can see, it is currently on the green bar, which is completely and utterly baseline. Obviously the higher up here it is, it'll be the tougher and more aggressive. Lower here, the better it is for me. And goals do actually get rid of corruption. So doing all of these might help me out for a bit before the corruption eventually tries to destroy me. So try and do your goals, try and keep your villages alive, and of course, very important, where you pick your first village is where you're able to spread out. If I actually zoom in, if I go to Gateway, as you can see, there are three lines from it. If I establish my village here, I can go to this village, this village, or this village next. So be advised, where you pick will be where you can go to establish your global empire. I usually pick Sandy South, but that is a personal choice, and I can obviously recommend several others. But for you, pick where you feel you will be best off. For demonstration purposes, I'll be picking maybe Sandy South and Narrow Path just to show how things can work. So when you first start off, you will see this big place camp button, you will see the region you have currently selected, and of course your buildings along here, your resources you don't have, and your spell selection. So, when you actually put your village down, your pixelites will be needing certain resources to build and you need to make sure you have them nearby when you start off. So they need these food to survive. You have to make sure you need to be next to some kind of food. They'll need water to survive, so make sure near some kind of water. They'll need trees to build, stone to build, and they'll also need the magic crystals of some variety to build more advanced buildings. So make sure you have food nearby, water nearby, wood nearby, crystals nearby and stone nearby. So looking at the map here as I can look around, I would say this is the best place for me to build. It's also my usual building spot when I'm doing a series. So I'm just going to put this down, it will teleport down, workers will spawn in, we have enough resources to build it, your first 12 pixelites, and they will build the village for you. After your pixelites have built the camp and obviously are doing nothing, you will need to make sure they can survive. Pixelites need three important things food, which we will turn into actual food, 
water, so they can actually have a drink, and of course, shelter. So to make shelters, go straight into, as you can see, housing, go to housing, and build a basic house. We'll build one here, and build one here. Let's build a third one just in case. So, as you can see, they will start building from nearby resources. On the side, you can see there's 12 of 12 builders. This is the job selection screen. You can take people off of it and add people to it. People will only build if they're on the builders segment. This little bit here is how many pixelites are currently free. That sound and this thing here means nomads have arrived. If they make it to your village centre, they will join your village. Now they are somewhere on the world map, they will be the one with the white circle on them. Once those pixel lights arrive, you get more villagers. Now one of the issues you will find out is your pixelite builders will gather whatever resources they need to make buildings. Usually to get wood you need lumberjacks, to get stone you need miners, but to actually have those resources before you have the buildings available, all you have to do is go down to the bottom left and get your gather tools. Six is harvest wood. As you can see, I have marked out the wood. Yellow markers are markers your pixelites can reach. Red markers are markers they cannot yet reach. And the green markers you can see are ones they are actively mining. So I have marked out some wood. I have marked out some stone. As I say, the builders will gather the resources they specifically need for the buildings actively being built. Now, as you can see in the top left, we now have four people living in the first housing block. So we do need to make a few more houses because you want to make sure that every single villager is safe from the heat of the sun in summer and the cold of the snow in winter. Both of those can and will kill your pixelites. As you can see this green area here, that is the influence area of your village. You can only build in the influence area, each building will expand the influence area and monsters cannot spawn within the influence area. So you have to make sure that you have enough space for your buildings. If you build walls, they will block your influence line of sight, which will be in a bit of the future area of this tutorial. So if you do build walls, you can block off influence of your village, so you have to make sure there's something on the other side you want to carry on building. So, you now have the beginnings of a village. You have some houses being built, your people, mainly your builders are gathering resources. What do you do now? Well, first of all, of course, make sure you have enough houses for your pixelites. Then you'll need to make sure they have some kind of food supply. Right now, as you can see, it is locked off. To get that, you need to build a farm. So I'm going to go into food and water and build a farm. So a farm, when it is built, will get a farmer who will gather dirty water to the farm to water the crops and nearby wild food. He will then water the wild food, make it grow and harvest it when the time is right. We are going to skip ahead to when that point has happened. Well, now you have your farm up and running as you can see, you can assign people to it. So I have five unemployed people, I'm going to have one farmer. You don't necessarily need extra farmers to farm because they generally do not do that much. Once they have watered the crops and gathered the crops like I've just done here, they will sit around and wait for more crops to obviously need water, to be picked and so on. So you don't need to fill it up too much with farmers. A lot of villages have had the problem at the beginning of putting everyone into farming and just dying out to not doing any other job. So yes, make sure you have at least one farmer, see how what he's doing, he will gather the crops, he will put in dirty water, and he will see how things go. You will also need some kind of water supply for your people, for them to actually get clean water. There are three ways of getting clean water. There is the rain cashew, which catches water when it rains. There is the water purifier, which sends a worker out to the dirty water, takes it back to purifier, and then there's a well. So we're going to go put down the water purifier because it is the quickest way of getting lots of water early on. Now as you can see here, this says we're out of building slots. We need to upgrade our camp or build an ancillary. If you look in the top left, it says we have 8 of 8 buildings and 0 of 1 ancillary. Ancillaries are storage buildings which also upgrade the amount of buildings you can have. You get 1 ancillary for every level of the camp. Upgrade the camp, you get more buildings and one ancillary. 
building and ancillary, you get more buildings. Upgrade the ancillary again, you get even more buildings. So, the best bet is always to upgrade the camp to start off with is six wood, six rocks, and to also go to your civics and build an ancillary. As you can see, it requires 32 wood and eight rocks. Now, of course, like I say, this will give me extra buildings. This will also give me extra buildings and one extra ancillary. So you need to keep making sure you can upgrade for as long as you can to keep on expanding your village. Now, of course, you don't want to expand and put too many buildings down at once because then your people will be stretched thin. If I click on any building, you can see here, this is at the bottom of the priority list. I can up it by one to make it ninth, I can up it to the top to make it top priority. Each and every building has a priority on when you placed it. Like this is the bottom because it's the last one to be done. Every time you upgrade something, it gets put to the end of the list. I just was priority one for a bit to make sure it's finished, so make sure that you prioritise the buildings you need to be built. Just by clicking any of them and going up or down. Very, very important. Now I'm going to switch to a different village, so I can show you the more advanced things when I actually have an ancillary and farmers and things going on. As you can see, this here is poorly watered. He will water it again as soon as he stops gathering food. But anyway, let's go on to a slightly more advanced village. So once you've set up your farming, you have your builders going around, and you have a need for more resources, you're going to have to start building your actual harvesting building. So if you actually look over here, we have the crystal, the lumber shack, and the mining. The mining, of course, grabs stone. The lumber shack grabs wood. And the crystal harvestry grabs crystals. So... These ones we need to make 24 wood, 24 rocks, 24 wood, 32 rocks. The crystal harvestry requires boards. Boards are an intermediate product. You'll be needing a different building for that. But first, let's just talk about raw resources. So, as you know, these will be grabbing raw resources unlimited. See that infinity number of raw resources going to be gathered. Over here at our makeshift mining facility, unlimited. Now, obviously, I've set up some miners here. I've got 30 people spare in this village. The stone cuttery has, un has 30. See this? The stone cuttery is an intermediate building. So, when you put down an intermediate building, this version I'll just quickly show you. I'm going to go down to refining. You have the crystallery, the lumber mill, the stone cuttery, and the forge. The forge takes metal, crystallery takes crystals, lumber mill takes wood into boards, and the stone cuttery takes rocks into cut stone. So, I'm just going to quickly build one straight up. And you see here, it says maintain 30. So that means this one's also maintaining 30. It's across the board. Jobs are shared across. This only had two jobs. So these two are four jobs. There'll be guys working both of them. One person will be working at each building. Or maybe two at one. But jobs are shared across the entire job lot of that building type. So all of the lumber mills will be sharing, all of the mining facilities will be sharing, all of the farms will be sharing. So I have two farmers for no reason, but if I had four makeshift farms, those two farmers would work at all four makeshift farms. So yes, make sure you have the right number of people for that job lot, not for that job building. Now the important thing to know about these next level intermediates, of course I will be needing boards from this to build the crystal harvester, is they start off Let's scroll down. At zero. They start off at no production whatsoever. So your problem will be if you build intermediate buildings, they don't have production set. They'll simply just go, we can like say I want to make five, I'll go make five immediately. That's simple. We can go, I want to maintain five. So I'll make sure there's always five inside your storage. Obviously make is immediately no matter what. Maintain will be there's always five in there. But of course, if you take it to the very end, like holding shift click, it's infinity. So you want to make sure you're building the right amount. So you go to intermediate buildings, which will be your crystallery, your forge, your lumber mill, and your stone cuttery, and make sure they are actually building something. A lot, an awful, awful lot of buildings and places have been destroyed. Entire villages have been wiped out because they haven't maintained a set number of resources have gone, oh, I know what I'm doing, I'm going to make ten. Then they wonder why all their defences are built and everything gets destroyed. So yes, raw resources are always infinity. Intermediate resources are always zero. So just simply, look, see, you can just 
go up to 500. Maintain, maybe shift click it straight up or down. So shift click to infinity or just set a number you like. See, Taylor Taylor died of dehydration. Obviously this village was set up to show you about intermediate resources, but I don't have anyone gathering water fast enough, so people are currently dying. See, these are rain catchers, I don't have anything actually gathering water. Very important to make sure you have water set up. Or you die, just like this. So quickly go in, we're going to go to here, go into harvesting, I'm just going to put one straight down of course. Food and water, you want to make sure that you actually have it set up properly. Obviously I am quickly X clicking, dropping one down, let's have a third person in, and there we go. So now we'll then be moving over to here, because of course there's no rain for them to deal with. So as you can see, these three buildings, all the water purifying buildings, share their people. If I put a well down, that would also be shared across them, because they're all water carriers. Again, make sure you have the people for the job lot, not for the building. Now, let's go on to more important things, as opposed to just getting your people to survive, casually running out of water. Now, once you have everything set up, the most important thing will be to make sure you have your next level of building. You have raw resources, intermediate resources, you want to be able to use them for something. So, we're going to go into the most important resources you can have, which are not in this one, they are in manufacturing. The boyer, the tumbler, obviously the armor smithy and the tool smithy are for your people, the boyer and the tumbler are the most important things you can have. The boyer will make arrows for your towers, and the tumbler will make rocks for your towers. At the very beginning you will have very little magic, so you want to make sure you have one of these down, again I'm just going to quickly insta build it, you won't be able to do that, build one of these as well. And have these set up, as you can see, this is maintaining 20 ballista bolts. No bows, no that. This one over here has no people in it, and as you can see, it's maintaining nothing. We're going to have this set up to unlimited. Now these ballista bolts and these stone balls will be used for your defence types. There are three defence types in the game. Active, defensive and neutral. So active defences will be, so active defences will be, if I go up to defences, they will be your guards and your golems. Now you're trying to keep your people alive, but you can if you want to build an outpost, I'm going to quickly put one down, and it will have people in it. Now, again, they can die, but they will fight, they'll also pick up equipment if there's any lying around, be a tall smithy and armor smithy. But it's only recommended to use this if you have a lot of surplus people and you don't care about the deaths. The other way to have active defences is the Golem Combobulators. There are three different types. Each one has different ways of fighting. Like, crystals generally are quite longer range, wood golems are weaker so you can have more of them, and stone, go stone golems are very heavy on the armour. As you can see it requires 24 rocks, 8 crystal. They're very simple to build, but they require mana to power. So I just put one down here. As you can see here, it has homing for two. This will show you how much power is currently stored. This shows you how much charge is currently on the golem it is making. Now there's no power in it, but as you can see, a little bit of power went across. So if you don't have too much mana, I'd recommend infantry. If you have a lot of power, I'd recommend golems. Golems are very useful for early on within the game. Now, See these over here, these are active stone golem combobulators. As you can see, they have full health, they have 200 mana within them, and they have 125 charge, which means a golem will spawn as soon as one golem is dead. Now, to get mana within the actual resources, you can do multiple things. You get them from just casually over time, you get them from resources being grabbed. If I use this tool quickly, I'll describe this in a second. It will leave behind little sparks. Do you see that little green thing? Those are mana sparks. If your hand is nearby, they go to you and charge your blue bar at the top. If you're not nearby, they go towards your nearest essence collectors. Once they go within the essence collectors, they get refined automatically and sent out to your buildings that require and your defences that require them. And golems and your soldiers will only work, I take a barracks, 
within the green influence area, that's why it's important, they will automatically attack and engage anything within the green influence. Outside the green influence, they just don't care. But within the green influence, they will actively hunt them down and attack. Hence, active defences. And again, if you want to build magic, we'll go into it now, because it's very important for the other defences as well, you'll want to make sure you have essence collectors. Very simple to build, 12 rocks, 8 crystals. That's all they are. But you'll make sure to have a couple of those to be gathering up the essence to turn it into magic to power up your golems and your magic defences. So the next portion of defences are defensive defences, which are basically turrets. So we've talked about magic, we've talked about ammo, having stone balls, having ballista bolts. In this little village set up, I don't have any of the actual ammo set up. I'd like to talk about defences. So you have ballistas, you have bow towers, bullet towers, elemental bolt towers, phantom dart, sling, spray, static, and attract and banish. So obviously, static, phantom dart, elemental bolt, attract and banish require magic. Ballista and bow require ballista bolts. Spray tower, sling tower, bullet tower, they require stone balls. You need to make sure you have the ammo being made for the equipment you've put down. So, I put down a bow, gonna also build it to here, as you can see. It's naught of 20 plus zero. So, each and every stack of ballista bolts put to this will make 20. If I put down a ballista tower, each stack will make 10. Now, this has a much larger firing range, as you can see. But it takes longer to fire and carries a lot less ammo, but you'll be requiring these to fire over the passive defences. Now obviously these, you want these to line defence as well. So, you have the elemental bolt tower, put this down, this requires magic to run. As you can see, it requires a lot to upgrade. So, if we're going on to that, we're going to put down a couple of the random things as well and show off the next level. So, you have the phantom dart tower as well, these are your basic ones, you want magic, these are very useful. Very easy to upgrade to, 12 wood for crystal. I'd highly recommend getting makeshift phantom dark towers combined with golems of defense. So, the final level of defenses are the static or passive defenses, which are the walls. So you can have fences, you can have gates, you can have stone walls, you can also have curtain walls. So the curtain wall is absolutely huge. As the name says, and actually in the info, only the ballista can shoot over it. They're very big and block line of sight. Also, when they are built, they will block... Let's, see, let's just go here to do this. A demonstration. They will block your influence. As you can see, the influence has been blocked. We now can't build here. The same goes for any and all wall pieces you build. Once you actually block off the area, you can't build in that area. Also, building walls does not actually use up your building slots. So you're going to have defences firing over the wooden fences or the stone walls, depending on the type of level you currently have. Because all defences, apart from the stone boulder tower, can fire over walls. Only the blister can fire over curtains. So I go back to defensive defences over here. Only the where are you? The sling tower cannot fire over any walls. It literally rolls a boulder along the ground. Everything else can fire over the top. It is up to you to make sure you have the right defences. But for first time fortifications, I highly recommend having phantom dart towers for the magic, golems for active defence, and very simple bow towers for basic. The bow towers are very easy to build, very easy to arm, and very low maintenance. Again, also with the phantom dart towers, which of course will be using your mana from your collector. So, to upgrade, every building can be upgraded. Just very simple, you click on the upgrade button, it shows you what it needs. This requires a lot of resources, it's one of the most advanced buildings in the game. You click start upgrade. It will still carry on being active while upgrading, so don't worry about it not firing anything. But of course it will now need more resources, like these houses over here, if I click on this makeshift house, it has three options for upgrading. 
As you can see, each one has different opportunities. This one is very good for sleeping and happiness and health, but gives you very little people. This one is your basic three people, some kind of happiness and bonus health. This one is less sleep speed, but gives you eight people. So you have to choose how you go. Once you've started basic upgrades, you're locked in. That's now going to be standard housing. This is going to be high occupancy. So is this one, because I need more people. So you want to make sure you have things upgrading, very simple. This is the basic upgrade, shows what it gives you. One builder slot, extra two range, and more for buildings. Again, also with the ancillary. Each upgrade will give you two more buildings, an extra one organizer. Everything can and will be upgraded. Absolutely everything. And each and every one will show you how many more people you get, like upgrading the mining facility will give me more workers available to work at it. Of course, I can get the same amount of workers putting another building in, but it depends entirely on how much space you've got and how heavy the enemy are attacking. Now, one final thing before we go into the magic section. The enemy will path towards the centre of your village. They will attack you and try and destroy you. Now, obviously you want to build walls to stop that. If you completely and utterly path yourself off so that the enemy can't path towards you by building walls across the entire fortification, the enemy will destroy the nearest wall to get to you. So instead of building a completely airtight wall, the recommendation is to build a maze. Basic maze is literally do that, maybe do that, seal it off. And now the enemy has to go through and around, let's say, as opposed to completely sealing it off. So build mazes, not walls. And man the mazes with your towers. But make sure you can build across everything, because the enemies can go through water. Be very mindful of that. Now, the final thing within the game is mana. As you can see here, here's my current total maximum influence. The more population you have, the higher the influence bar will be. Your influence will regenerate over time to the maximum of the influence you currently have. Now, obviously, I don't have that many people here, so it's very low. You can also gather influence like I've shown you before with the grab tool. If I just do this, see that? Mana is coming out of the area I have destroyed. Now, the mana obviously is useful for your people if you let it go to them, but it's very useful for you. The grab tool I'm currently using, see this orange bar here, is how much mana it's going to use. It's very little, but you can grab resources yourself and use them to build buildings. So if you have plenty of resources at the very beginning, I highly recommend using the grab tool to build for you. As you see, it's not too much. Now, obviously, you also have access to 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. You can custom tailor your spells. You can change the spell dead simple. So obviously, I, let's say I want this one to be meteorites, and this one to I want it to be recall. So I can actually have ease of use. As you can see, each and every spell uses a different amount of mana. So you can actually see how much you currently have to be used. Now, red spells are aggressive. Green spells are basically healing and defensive. And the yellowy orange spells are world spells. Now, a meteorite drops a flaming space rock. The earthquake drops an earthquake. Flame is pretty basic. It's a teeny little flame. Very good for wiping out enemy positions. You also have Lightning, much more aggressive. Banish will literally banish enemies from where you've put it for a few seconds to random areas of the map. Very useful if you have a breach in the defences. The Cold Aura slows things down. And of course, Magic Bolts will zap enemies with Magic Bolts. The Healing Aura heals your people within the aura. Here's the area it covers, as you can see. It's just around this area. Everything within it heals. Your people quite like seeing spells go. Sometimes they panic and run. Now, obviously, you can summon a holy golem, which is a basic golem which slowly runs out of health over time. You can resurrect the dead. The dead have a chance of coming back as ghosts during the twilight hours of night. So you can sometimes resurrect the dead. You can mend golems. Of course, you have to hope they stay still. You can obviously charm monsters attacking their friends. It doesn't last for long. And of course, you have regenerate, which will heal things over time. It works on monsters works on villagers, does not work on golems. Then you also have Motivate the Land, which grows your crystals, grows your wood, also grows your food. These are living resources. You can't grow stone, I'm afraid to say. You also dissolve resources. You drop one of these, it basically as if you picked it up yourself, your people had mined it. 
it will dissolve living resources into these little wispy pieces of, res of mana. As you can see, I'm grabbing them, but I could just use them to go and power my village. Recall recalls villagers. It's very good for using on nomads who are trapped and fighting enemies. Storm, very self-explanatory. Summons a storm. Lightning, death, lots of rain. Very good for regrowing trees. Then you can conjure essence out of thin air, but it's a little bit eh. It's much better to dissolve the land, as you can see here. Huge amounts of wisps. You can conjure random materials. A little bit expensive again. And of course you can illuminate at night time, it's a bit too dark for you. So these spells will be super useful, and you have to make sure you have the mana and the people to use them. But again, your greatest spell will be grab. See, I'm literally building for my people. Then powering up from that spell I cast. And there you go. Now the only way to really get stone on the same area, I'm going to do something stupid, is summon a meteor. which should hopefully give you rock, there you go. Or, if you're being really, really dumb, summon an earthquake. Which will do earthquakey things and occasionally show, let's see, it'll do damage to the area, destroy buildings, and also summon more rock. So, if you really are desperate for rocks, have a lot of resources, go crazy, destroy the enemy. Just don't do it in the center of your village, as you can tell. Nasty things are happening, but I don't care about any of these pixelites. Sod them. Oh. And also mud will appear. You can destroy that at the very bottom. You can just destroy the terrain. Like this. I can get rid of this. You can get rid of water. You can get rid of buildings. You can pause them. But these mud areas will be... Well, basically there will be water. Whenever it rains, they will fill with water. When you destroy rocks or trees... I'll quickly demonstrate that as well before I go. Do this. Come on. Come here. You see that there? Those are destroyed trees. Now they can regrow over time, they'll regrow faster if it rains on them, but they are basically destroyed trees. If you don't like them, you can just do this, the terrain, and get rid of them that way. You can't build on destroyed resources. Same again with the stone. The stone is a bit of an issue though, as you can see. These little areas they leave on the floor, they won't regenerate, but they will stop you building on them, so you're going to have to use the Destroy Terrain tool to get rid of them like that, to build upon them. That about covers the whole of the building and looking after your village. The enemy will spawn in, the corruption will spawn in, but that is for later, so to teach you defences, please, please build mazes, teaching you basics of your village, and hopefully you will build a vape basically good village which may or may not survive first contact with the enemy either way i have been the fallen shogun and i wish you luck in your journey upon the pixelite villages of rise to ruins ciao for now people bye bye